Okay, everybody, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am John White, the President and CEO of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. And I just want to welcome everyone uh, to the opening ceremonies for the, uh, this year, our 24th annual National Ocean Sciences Bowl Finals. If you were here for some other event, you're in the wrong place. So I just want to say, uh, this is a pleasure and an honor as always for me to be here. Uh, this is my sixth and final time that I will be here as the MC and as uh, in my current role as president and CEO as I'll be retiring from the Consortium for Leadership, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership at the end of the month. Uh, but hopefully not my national NLSB, whether finals or regionals, as I do intend to volunteer in the future. Uh, my replacement is Dr. Alan Leonardi. Uh, for several years, he's been running the Ocean Exploration Program at NOAA. Uh, a lot of you know him and know of him. Uh, again, he'll be coming on board in a couple of weeks. Uh, Alan was a volunteer and even a moderator at the Manatee Bowl uh, a few years ago. So for the second year now, we are holding this event virtually as, uh, as the impacts of COVID-19 are having still you know, or forcing us to do it this way. Uh, but the good news is it does uh, help us to bring people from the country all over, all together like this in a virtual means and still get going uh, and proceed with this wonderful event. So while it may be different and the competition is a bit different, I know that you will all make the most of the opportunity and if you will participate in the planned activities, I mean, there's some great activities, the virtual field trips and whatnot are just, they're gonna be fantastic. So I know you'll really enjoy that. And you'll continue to learn about ocean science, ocean related careers, interacting with your peers as much as possible. Uh, certainly the career mentorship event later on next week is also going to be very valuable. Uh, I wanna thank everyone, all of uh, the, Certainly the actual members of the team, those who, and all those who helped you to get here, uh, which is a long list of people in your lives and in certainly involved at the regional and national level of NOSB. Uh, I also looking forward as we all see the pandemic, uh, you know, looks like it's receding. We hope uh, that it's gonna continue to do so. And next year in 2022, we'll be back to in-person regionals and finals. Uh, of course, we'll have to continue to assess this and see what happens, but I think uh, we're all looking forward to that. Uh, I also want to say that all of our hearts go out to those in the NOSB family who were currently are negatively impacted by the ongoing situation and pandemic. Uh, you see the shirt I'm wearing. I'm wearing this shirt not just because the color matches the background, but also because this is actually uh, a shirt from the Bay Scallop Bowl of 2020. That's one of the bowls that was not able to, that they were not able to hold this year uh, due to the impacts of the pandemic. Also, I just wanted to note the passing of Dr. Larry Swanson, not from COVID, uh, but he died this past fall. Uh, and uh, he was, you know, he brought really, or was, you know, the driving force behind bringing the National Ocean Sciences Bowl or sorry, the base scholar board on board up there uh, in the New York area. So uh, certainly our hearts go out to everyone. Just wanted to actually mention that. So it's been a tough year. Everybody's been impacted in one way or another, but on a positive note, we have 21 teams that are here to compete in the finals and it's gonna be a great finals, I know. Uh, a lot of people I recognize, a lot of new people, but uh, it's gonna be great. So again, uh, great field trips that are coming up. Uh, you know, one actually sponsored by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Um, and uh, you know, they, they are a new sponsor and new member of the consortium as well. They're also becoming more and more involved in ocean exploration, things like that, as you may know. Uh, they're also uh, gonna be getting a new ship, the Falcor 2 in the future. So growing part of the philanthropic ocean science community, it's great to have them on board certainly this year and in the future as well. Um, also during our mentoring visits, as I mentioned, a lot of people are gonna be there to interact with all of you. Take advantage of these opportunities. You know, How did they get to where they were? What decisions did they make? How did they know where to go to college? Did they change their major? Uh, I always like to tell the story that Kathy Sullivan, astronaut and oceanographer, 
uh, was like an English major until she had a basic oceanography course at UC Santa Cruz uh, from Dr. Gary Griggs. And that one course changed her and she took up ocean science, actually ended up joining the Navy like me. And then she ended up being an astronaut and being the first American woman to walk in space and made some adjustment to the Hubble telescope. Now she's been in Rolling Stone and even has a Lego thing going on. So it's great. Uh, Still lucky to keep our sponsors on board. We would not be here uh, without them. So I'd like to just list them briefly. One is NOAA, as I mentioned, also the Schmidt Ocean Institute, the Gulf Research Program at the National Academies of Sciences, uh, and certainly, uh, and uh, other sponsors are NASA, Shell, the American Honda Foundation, and Lockheed Martin, Curtis and Edith Munson Foundation, Bowen, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management under the Department of Interior, Marine Mammal Commission. Uh, they're also new in 2021. Uh, and that was because they had an employee who volunteered for their virtual finals last year when so impressed. So you made a positive impression. So thank you for that, for those of you who were here last year. McGregor, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory of the Department of Energy, the Marine Technology Society, and the IEEE Ocean Engineering Society. So please, a just a virtual round of applause for them. Uh, our 2021 theme this year is plunging into our polar seas. It was determined in partnership with our regional partners at the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder, home of the Trout Bowl, home of the finals a few years ago, and they're known as Ceres for short. And you'll be hearing with uh, one of our guest speakers tonight is from Ceres. Uh, this theme really highlights the importance of the polar regions and the Arctic Ocean and the Southern Ocean and all the things going on with that and a need for continued research. Um, as we look at the loss of sea ice and its impact uh, you know, on changing environments, we look at the melting uh, of the ice and, and you know, you know, the ice cap in the Antarctic and the ice shells, and you'll hear much more about that. But we just know that really you know, these poles and what's changing there is having huge impacts on our planet, on you know, and the impacts of climate change are being felt most there. And we really want to understand what's going to happen in the future with climate change. Uh, we know that these regions are bellwethers for what's going to happen, but they're also major influences, whether whether it's circulations, whether it's changes in biodiversity, and certainly its impacts on the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the Earth system. Uh, so I can't think of a better topic right now as we are still, as everyone becomes more and more focused on climate change and what are we gonna do about it? Mitigation, adaptation, but most of all, it's understanding so we can do a better job of prediction. And that's what a lot of this research is about. So it's great to have this as a topic exactly the right time. So, uh, since you're tired of hearing from me, uh, we're gonna start our opening ceremony uh, with two speakers. I mentioned one of them and they're gonna each is gonna highlight one of our polar regions or both of them and the importance of them and uh, the research that they conduct and what about the polar regions inspired and inspires them today. Uh, so without further ado, our first speaker is Dr. Hugh Griffiths from the British Antarctic Survey. Uh, he grew up in the coast of West Wales, uh, spent most of his childhood playing on the beach and exploring rock pools like probably many of us. Uh, he continued to explore everything from rock pools to the deep sea and all over the parts of Antarctica. He's been on several expeditions and been investigating the benthic biodiversity and biogeography and the ecological patterns in both space and time. Sounds like time travel, but it's not. Uh, he's a passionate believer also in science of communication, making science more accessible to the public and policymakers. You, of course, get a chance to do that in the science expert briefings. And also, you know, uh, he reg regularly presents his work to the media, schools, and open days and special events. He's also written two plain language advice documents for Antarctic Environments Portal on marine biodiversity and plastic pollution. Another scourge of, that is also we are very concerned about, of course. And I look forward to hearing what he's found down in Antarctica in relation to uh, any types of ocean plastic. So with that, I will shut up. Hugh, thank you so much for being here, by the way. It's one o'clock, just past one o'clock in the morning in the UK. So a special round of thanks for you for being here uh, at such an odd time. So Hugh, over to you, thanks again. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and it's a real honor to be invited. Um, I, um, I'm starting with an image of the world's biggest iceberg, which um, 
died last week. It essentially melted away to not be even being counted as an iceberg that we monitor anymore. And that's part of the life cycle of Antarctica is a huge amount of ice. And this ice is everywhere, but there are different forms of ice. Um, so if you look at Antarctica from space, at the bottom of our planet, as we think of it, it's literally the opposite of the Arctic. It's the Antarctic. And it opposite in many other ways as well. So the Arctic, whilst being an ocean surrounded by land, Antarctica is land surrounded by ocean. It's covered in thick ice. On the land, less than 0.4% of the land is ice free. So that means I don't really have to explain terrestrial biology to too much because it's very simple. But life in the sea is very rich and it's dominated by what you can see around Antarctica, which is sea ice, which doubles the size of the area of the continent every winter. And Antarctica is the coldest, highest, driest, windiest place on Earth. And it's effectively a desert with virtually no free running water on land. And it makes it a real contradiction that somewhere that has so much fresh water trapped up and none of that is usable. And Antarctica is really cold because of a whole combination of things. When Antarctica used to be connected to the other continents of the world, there was tropical forest growing there. And even when it had six months of darkness, there were plants and animals in Antarctica on land. But as the other continents moved away from Antarctica, this gap that you can see where the arrows are going through emerged. And that means there's an area between about 40 degrees south and 60 degrees south where there's no land to slow down the winds. And what you see in red is the areas that have the strongest winds in the world. And so the roaring 40s, furious 50s and screaming 60s are named because of the strength of the winds. And those winds, as well as making it a very difficult place to work for marine biologists in ships, also drive huge ocean currents that really make the world go round. Um, these currents push the ocean around in a clockwise motion around Antarctica. And this is the biggest, fastest, strongest current in the world, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And it's huge and it almost goes to full depth in the ocean. And it really is the dynamo driving the world's oceans, but it also isolates Antarctica from any warm water that might be moving from the equator southward. So it doesn't let any warm water in and has allowed Antarctica to get colder and colder over time. And when I say Antarctica is isolated, this rotation and this current also connect it to the rest of the world. And if you look at this map, it's the, a map of the world, but flipped around. So instead of worrying about where the land is, it puts the ocean at the center of the map. Right smack bang in the middle of the map is Antarctica. And the currents that go around Antarctica drive the global, global ocean thermohaline circulation, which means it takes heat from the tropics and moves it to the poles, cools water down. And without the Antarctic system working, we wouldn't have oxygen in the deep sea, for example. So it's really connected to the whole world. And there was a I mean, in my introduction, it was mentioned I study plastics in Antarctica, and with only a tiny percentage of the world's people living in Antarctica, you'd think there'd be hardly any plastic pollution there. But this thermohaline circulation brings with it things from outside of Antarctica, and we end up in some parts of the Antarctic Peninsula with microplastic levels as high as you'd get next to some large cities in the US right on the coast. So although Antarctica is isolated in many ways, it's exposed to climate change, plastic pollution, ozone thinning, all of these things that come from our activities elsewhere in the world. But in many ways it is truly isolated. So if you look at these two maps, one is sea surface temperature and one is sea floor temperature. And you can see that at the surface on the left-hand side, the temperatures outside the Antarctic at the sea surface get quite warm but there's a definite line where that current is around Antarctica that stops any of that warm water reaching the Antarctic. Whereas at the seafloor, actually the cold water generated in Antarctica can be traced off the coast of Rio and right up into the Northern Hemisphere. And we even have some species that you can trace that originated in Antarctica have spread out into the rest of the world using this slower moving cold water. And all of that cold 
and the seasonal darkness of six months of darkness enables sea ice to form. And this is a, um, an animation of the sea ice around Antarctica in the 2016-2017 season when it reached its lowest point ever on record. And you can see that sea ice is a huge part of the Antarctic marine ecosystem. For half of the year, it, most of it's covered in ice. And then that ice melts away in springtime, leading to huge plankton blooms, and a large amount of food existing for whales, seals, penguins, things like that, but also a lot of that food sinking down to the sea floor. And that ice is really the driver of that huge amount of productivity we have in the Antarctic summer. So life in the sea, I'm going to skip the life in the land part for an ocean's bowl and um, describe what everybody expects to see. In my first image, it's penguins. And this is a kind of schematic summary of the Antarctic and all the different types of life we find in the oceans. And there are around 20,000 species that we know of from the Antarctic and from the Southern Ocean. And that's, that's a huge number when most people just think of this kind of white, flat surface this biggest desert in the world, as I've said. So the 20,000 species break down in a way that might surprise many people. So only about 90 species make up the cute, cuddly, fluffy, feathered whale seals, penguins, albatrosses, all the things that we recognize from Antarctica. And if I asked you to draw an Antarctic animal, you'd probably pick one of those. And they are everywhere. These are a selection of images. This is just my chance to show off for my last expedition that I took with a normal camera whilst based on the ship without even having to leave a ship. This much wildlife came to us. It's totally unafraid. It's like nowhere else on earth where these animals have never seen human beings. A lot of the species have never been commercially harvested or hunted. So they're just not afraid of us. And it means that we get visitors to the ship to find out who we are. And penguins are the most common bird in the Antarctic, as you'd expect, and there are literally millions of them. Um, and of the roughly 17 different types of penguin in the world, only two of them are hardy and tough enough to make the true Antarctic continent their home. And the Emperor penguin, which is the one you'll see in things like March of the Penguins and Happy Feet and things, and then also the much smaller Adelie penguin. And the Emperor penguin is a beautiful bird. It's very tall. It's surprisingly tall. It's about half my height. And it's not the biggest penguin that's ever existed. About 30 million years ago, there was one that was two meters tall. So I'm quite happy that the biggest one we have now is, a, um, is one that I can actually stand over. But um, my favorite penguin is actually the Adelie penguin. Daily penguins are incredibly tough, hardy. They'll take on predators far bigger than them and scare them off. They'll, they have no fear of anybody else. And the only thing at the time you ever see them kind of running away from a fight is when you get a situation like this where the, a huge ship comes along and they suddenly realize that this is, thing is much bigger than them. And as you can see, on land, they're waddling and funny, but through the ocean, they really move like little torpedoes and they're super fast and super sleek and really well designed for the habitat they live in. Of course, they're not the cleverest things in the world and one goes completely the wrong way at the end there. But um, essentially these animals are amazing and they nest in places that human beings couldn't survive without a lot of equipment. Along with the penguins, there are seals and there are six Antarctic seal species, leopard seals, Ross seals, Weddell seals, crab eater seals, which don't eat crabs. They actually eat krill, um, fur seals and elephant seals. And the largest of these is the elephant seal. And elephant seals can dive down to over 2000 meters, so two kilometers, um, and they are huge. And we use them, oceanographers use them because they go, they can dive to places that we can't send remotely operated vehicles, for example. So sometimes scientists will strap equipment for collecting oceanographic data to these huge elephant seals. And they'll dive down to the bottom of the ocean looking for octopus and squid and things to eat. And they're quite amazing. But we also have a lot of whales in Antarctica. And it's actually one of the most amazing places to see whales if, if you love whales. And they have everything from the 
giant blue whale through to much smaller minke whales and killer whales and things like that. And this short clip of video is from my last expedition as well, where there were minke whales chasing us through the sea ice. So they seem to do it for fun, just like dolphins chasing a bow wave. And they raced us through gaps in the ocean and around us for hundreds of miles, the whole ocean is frozen. So you only get these small lee ways through, but these whales spend their entire lives in and amongst the frozen ocean, looking for air holes and feeding on krill. And they tend to move in family groups and they will just come and check out the next big noisy ship that comes in the area and play with us. The only organism that's really hunting any of these whales and things down there are orca, so killer whales. And they're a huge number, about 160,000 of these whales that are the top predators in the region. And again, no fear, this photograph was taken from the jetty or the wharf at our Rothera research station in Antarctica. And you can regularly see them if you stand up at the end, edge of our station, you can see the whales training their young to hunt seals by knocking them off the ice flows. So what we end up with is at the surface, all these air breathing mammals and birds that are in a food chain that's actually quite short. So we have phytoplankton, microscopic plants in the ocean, feeding krill, and then pretty much everything else either eats krill or directly eats something that eats krill. So this food chain is dependent on this keystone species that's one of the most numerous organisms on the planet. And it feeds all of those things you see at the surface. So if we delve a little deeper, we can look into life in the plankton. And as you can see, microscopic plants are the basis of all their food in Antarctica. And they do incredibly well because they're stored up in the sea ice over winter. And then as the sea ice melts, it releases and you get this huge injection of life just at the right time for spring and it kickstarts the food chain. And in the plankton and in the kind of midwater depths, we have about 700 species out of that 20,000. And as I said, the key one is really krill. You can imagine this as a, a bag of fat, a perfect meal of a couple of centimeters long that is ideal food for all those whales and seals and everything else. But they also play a huge role in supporting the rest of the biodiversity in Antarctica. Tiny plants at the surface don't sink, they're designed to float. Krill eat them and they're quite messy eaters, so they drop spitballs and things, but they also poop out little pellets that sink a lot better than the plankton and that sinks to the bottom of the ocean and feeds pretty much everything else in Antarctica. And life at the bottom of the sea is incredibly rich compared to that cold white desert at the surface. The seawater is about minus two degrees centigrade in most places, but you still have a rich diversity of life. Over 19,000 species and more being discovered all the time. And if I had more time, I would bore you all to death with pictures of every single one and stories about how amazing they all are. But this is just an image to give you an idea of the diversity and scale of life in Antarctica. The large orange multi-armed starfish in the middle, that is absolutely huge and has 50 arms and catches krill that go floating past it in the water column. There are sea cucumbers close to about half a meter long. There are giant multi-legged sea spiders that um, get to the size of dinner plates. And also many people don't know that we have lots of other life like corals and sponges and things like that that you'd expect to see on a tropical reef maybe, but making their home in very cold water. And if you look at this image, this is one of the images we took, and th there are things in this image which you may not recognize so well from other places in the world, like crinoids or feather stars, and huge sponges, some of them up to two meters tall, and at every surface of these rocks is covered in life. And it's some of the highest biomasses of anywhere in the world. We also have fish and other groups of animals, but we're lacking some things like sharks. And um, most types of crabs are also missing from Antarctica because it is so cold. So it allows groups like the crinoids, the feather stars, to live and be more abundant than they would be elsewhere. 
And this is all due to that food raining down from above. And not all of that food is krill poop. Some of it is dead penguins, dead whales, uh, dead seals, and all their poop. And in this case, it's a, a, a deli penguin that's being eaten by starfish and sea urchins. So the, sometimes the food chain's flipped on its head. Obviously, not everywhere is a rocky seafloor. And huge areas around the Southern Ocean are made up of dead diatoms. So that's stuff that's raining down from above. And this is a, um, the interesting animal in the middle is the white thing is a combination of a gastropod snail and it's carrying and is always carrying a sea anemone on its shell as protection and the anemone gets carried around for the next meal and inside that mud you can see little bits sticking out there are worms brittle stars all sorts of things and the amount of biomass again hidden away in that mud is huge and the amount of food hidden in that mud is um, enormous and then you get mixed substrates where you get a whole combination of different species and it's a really interesting that there's such a wide diversity of life and different habitats within a place that most people think of as a desert. And as I said, we're finding new species in Antarctica all the time. And I get to show off now because I've had two very ugly species of sea cucumbers named after me by Australian colleagues. And they come from the first ever expedition I did when I went to Antarctica when I was younger. And we're finding new species all the time, somewhere between 10 and 20% of the animals we bring up from the seafloor on every expedition are new to science. It, and if we go into the deep sea around Antarctica, it can be 80 to 100% of the animals in a net are new to science. And I don't want to finish without telling you, showing you a little bit of what it's like. So this video shows you ROV footage from the bottom of the sea in Antarctica, where you've got corals, sponges, um, sea squirts, tube worms, amphipods, isopods. You've got a fish that lives in a sponge in a place where they've never seen daylight before, but they use the light from the ROV to help them catch krill. Um, and krill have bioluminescence, so they're quite easy to spot anyway. There's an octopus, there's an ice fish, and ice fish have no red blood cells because there's so much oxygen in the water, they don't need them, but they do have and um, antifreeze proteins in their blood to stop them freezing up. And then we have these enormous glass sponges built out of essentially fiberglass they're, and they get very big. And then some of those crinoids I was talking about, the feather stars, actually swimming because they've been disturbed by the ROV. And then we end up on a sponge and sea anemone garden. So this is a huge area. And the sea anemone you're looking at in the middle is about a meter across. And then we have these tall sponges and all sorts of things. And some of these things can be tens of thousands of years old. And in other places, the seafloor is wiped clean by huge icebergs. And that's one of the things that concerns us now in terms of climate change and things, is that some of these areas have been safe from iceberg scouring for a very long time. And so we have very old, very established communities like this. And in other places, we're starting to see those patterns changing, more ice breaking off ice shelves and damaging the seafloor more. And with less winter sea ice around to keep those icebergs still, they're even doing damage during winter. So I don't want to give you lots of negative things about Antarctica. because To me, it's just an amazing place with a huge amount of biodiversity. But we have to acknowledge that the oceans are warming faster almost than anywhere else in the world. There's ocean acidification affecting it, microplastics. We have to look at how much human consumption comes out of the Southern Ocean to check that that doesn't exceed what's capable with climate change. So there are a lot of issues facing the Southern Ocean, but my main take home message is that Antarctica is an amazing place and there's life down there that many of you may not be expecting to see. And if you are lucky enough to ever get to work there, you'd probably be able to get a species named after you too. And I'd just like to thank you all for your attention. And if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. It looks like we have a question from Henry Centers. If you want to turn on your video, you can ask it live. Um, yeah, actually, um, it was about that last slide. Um, what was that? What was in there? <laughs>
the the big yellowy thing stick it. It's, it's a sponge, and sponges really are. If krill are the really important organisms near the surface, sponges are essential to life in the deeper water and on the seafloor. They're almost like um, I don't know a high rise apartment block or something for all the other life. So some fish use them for living in, others use them for laying their eggs in. There are worms that live inside the sponge. There is snails that live there. There. Are, so for every sponge, there may be hundreds or thousands of individual animals living on or in it, and maybe tens or hundreds of species living on it as well. So it's kind of like the equivalent of your rainforest, but in the ocean. Diana Cannon, did you have a question? Uh I was just clapping, but I'll, I will ask a question. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you explore down in that area? Um, you said, mentioned ROVs. Is that the only technique you use? Um, no, and it's quite basic in the poles because it's cold. And if you throw in technology in cold water, you will normally end up with dead technology. So I've witnessed small ROVs die within 10 minutes of getting in the water because they're so cold when they're in the cold air, that when you put them into the water, they tend to just freeze up all the electronics and things. So we do a lot of basic stuff. We do drop down cameras, sort of Toyo or sort of cameras that we just lower down on a, on a wire. We do a lot of collecting physical specimens using, we have divers that work at our stations, but then when we go deeper, we use very small fishing nets to collect what we need. So not just destroying huge areas of ocean floor, but kind of targeted fishing. Um, and we also have things like moorings and gliders and all sorts of other things that study the oceanography for us. So we use those kind of technologies, but I've been on vessels where we've lost several of the fancy bits of technology because either the, an iceberg's gone over the top of them or they just stop working in the cold. And batteries and things just don't last that long in the cold compared to other places. Any other questions? Remember just to use either the thumbs up or clap reaction. Okay, well, thank you, Hugh. Thank you, and thanks for having me. And um, I hope you well, all wait, have a wait, brilliant wait, wait. time. Hold on, hold on, Hugh. Oh. Nobody else, I have one more question for you. <laughs> I have a couple of claps also. Okay. Uh, but I have, uh, so, and I'm, you know, not an expert, certainly in any field. I'm just, you know, sort of a wave top type of understanding guy. But uh, it's my understanding that, you know, for many years there was a belief, and we know there was a belief there wasn't much life in the deep ocean and the, the, you know, down on near and around the seafloor. The same thing I believe in is true in the Antarctic region. At what point or what types of technologies led to sort of this sort of new understanding of this whole life cycle, these changes in the food chain? These, you know, things like ice fish with antifreeze and no red blood cells. When did all this happen? And, you, you know, in terms of, and were there any types of scientific or technological breakthroughs that sort of allowed, allowed that? Uh, just out of curiosity. It's, it's interesting because in the polar region, some of it is still very basic. We're behind on some of the technologies because it is harder to use there. But some of the major breakthroughs were just done by people like Captain Scott and his team just putting nets down the first time they went there. We have... You know, the, the first ever giant sea spiders and stuff were found and described by them and all these kind of things. And they really did observe. There was a lot of science going on on those early missions. And but now we we have all sorts of technologies and we have sort of environmental DNA and things like that to help us find species that we can't necessarily see, but leave their traces in the ocean. And one of the most amazing discoveries I've been involved with was a bit of blind luck recently where some geologists were drilling through some of those very thick floating ice shelves and they drilled through 900 meters of ice and then lowered a what was supposed to collect sediment cores from underneath the ice shelf to tell us the history of the ice shelf and they instead of hitting mud hit a boulder and luckily they had a gopro attached to their equipment and they actually filmed the first ever hard substrate so rocky seafloor underneath one of these ice shelves and found a whole community of animals, of sponges, living on a rock 260 kilometers away from any food source. So these things are pretty much living on the ultimate low calorie diet. And then when we looked at the oceanography, 
they're probably at the end of a, a set of currents that mean their food is actually coming about a thousand kilometers before it gets to them. So it may be weeks, months, or even decades between meals for these animals. And we only discovered that because somebody else was drilling a hole in the ice and happened to have their project fail because they hit the rock instead of the mud. So we're still discovering things by accident in Antarctica, let alone sort of all the technology and everything else we can employ, because those are areas that it's impossible to take our traditional technology to when the ice is 900 meters thick and you're 260 kilometers from open ocean, none of our current techniques can answer those questions. Okay, it looks like actually we had a few other hands that came up, so I think we've caught them all. Um, Mark Toholka, do you have a question? No, no question. That was just applause. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, Yuchen Lee. Yeah, I was just giving a pause. I really like to talk. Oh. <laughs> just want to check. Maxwell So. Uh, I was just giving a pause. Okay. And then Thank just you. checking. Jacob Stein. Applause. Okay, good to go then. Thank you. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you very much and have a brilliant time with your competition. All right. Thanks very much, Hugh. Wonderful presentation. Also, Hugh was part of the census of marine life. Uh, back from 2001 to 2010, where we basically, and it was a program that, the, that we ran at the Consortium for Ocean Leadership and Kristen Urensik, uh, most of you know, was part of that, leading part of that effort. So uh, as she mentioned, that program for COL. The, uh, we look forward, hopefully, to a sense of marine life too, maybe as part of the UN decade one of these days. We have so much more to do and the technologies and scientific capabilities, such as environmental DNA, just really allow us to get after solving the rest of the sort of unknowns in terms of abundance, diversity, and distribution of life throughout the ocean, especially in those hard to get at areas. So thank you again, Hugh. I know you're probably thanks. not going to stick around. You may want to catch an hour or two of sleep. But, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but thanks again so much for taking time out of your night to be here. And uh, again, we wish you well, and we'll be following you in future expeditions. Thank All you. Right. Cheers. And now, as we flip the polls here, we go over to Matthew Shoup from uh, Ceres, as I mentioned. Uh, he is a research scientist with Ceres and um, with the NOAA Earth Systems Research Laboratory, ESRL. Uh, his key focus is looking at coupling of ocean atmosphere ice in the Arctic system uh, and uh, with the specific focus on the energy budgets and cloud, you know, the impacts of those energy budgets on cloud precipitation, aerosol processes those type of things and modeling those. Again, so important to understand the physical things happening in the Arctic region. Uh, and you know, the balance is there as an integrator across the whole earth system. And again, also, so he finds that as a lot of us do, very intriguing, not to mention looking at the fantastic vistas, experiences, wildlife uh, and everything, just basically as we heard, um, certainly from Hugh. So Matthew, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for your great support and your institution's support of the Ocean Sciences Bowl. Over to you, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to start up my uh, presentation here. Um, thanks for having me. Um, as advertised, I'm not an oceanographer and I, I don't do a lot of ocean research myself, although I do a lot of work that's very relevant for the ocean and very relevant for the sea ice, which is kind of part of the ocean uh, in the Arctic. Um, and so here I'm gonna focus on a, a major expedition that we did called Mosaic, the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. And this was a year in the Arctic sea ice. So it's quite an adventure. I'll take you on a little bit of that adventure, show you some nice pictures and, and you know talk a little bit about the science that we're looking at, the problems we're trying to solve by going into the Arctic system. And so first, a little bit about myself. I'm a senior research scientist at the University of Colorado in NOAA. I've been doing Arctic research for about 23 years, again, focused on the atmosphere, clouds, surface energy budgets. And I was one of the co-coordinators of Mosaic. And we'll learn about Mosaic here in the coming slides. But the Arctic, this is the scene for this presentation. And it, it's on the top of the earth. You know, if Hugh was at the bottom there. Uh, and, and as Hugh already mentioned, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic are quite different, and the Arctic, of course, is an ocean, uh, and that ocean 
uh, is surrounded by land masses. So uh, it's quite a different scene there and with a number of different processes uh, that are really important. And of course, uh, you know, in the, in the northern uh, reaches of the earth, we also have lots of frozen surfaces. We have sea ice on the ocean. We have uh, the Greenland ice sheet. We have snow and permafrost. So again, the cryosphere is so important. And a lot of my work is focused on the cryosphere and how energy budgets are affecting that, affecting melt and change. And so uh, that's really what draws me to the Arctic. So why though would we study the Arctic system? Well, the Arctic system is changing rapidly. I think we all understand that, melting ice and things like that. We also have very poor model predictive capabilities, right? We build these climate models, these weather models that tell us something about the Earth system. Uh, and those actually struggle in the Arctic for a number of reasons. There are also a lot of emerging operational and management needs, right? So as the Arctic is changing, there's resource development, there's tourism, there's shipping, uh, there's all kinds of national security issues. So these things have to be managed. And there are also great uh, and important questions about the linkages between Arctic change and the change of the rest of the global system. And lastly, we have very few observations from the Arctic uh, from which to, to build our understanding. So we really need to go there into the Arctic uh, to observe. So I wanna start with this diagram. Um, and this is really getting at uh, the whole notion of global change and Arctic change. And what we're seeing here uh, is a plot on the bottom axis is years. So going from you know, 1950 up to the year 2020. Uh, and on the other axis, on the Y axis is a latitude of our earth. Minus 90 is the South Pole, plus 90 is the North Pole. Uh, and of course, zero is the equator. And what we see it plotted here is the zonal mean temperature. So this is around a latitude band of the earth, the average temperature. Um, over time and how that is related to the long-term mean. And the long-term here is 1951 to 1980. And you see, as you look right in this, that, that you start to get some of these yellow colors emerge. This is warming. You see these small positive values. This is global warming. Uh, and, and that's a really important aspect of the, the Earth system. And, you know, the science behind global warming is actually, you know, really sealed. It's really easy to understand the processes there. But one of the things that we don't necessarily understand so well is how is this warming spread across the earth? And, and what does that do at a, at a kind of a process level? How does that affect us? And it turns out that in the Arctic, you see in this diagram, that we have all these orange and red colors in the Arctic. And that says the Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the globe, at least twice as fast in many areas, three times as fast as the rest of the globe. So this is called Arctic amplification. And it's a really important aspect of the Arctic system. But why are temperature changes amplified in the Arctic? And in short, we can say there are feedbacks. Uh, and so one that you know, most of you probably understand pretty well is we start with increasing global temperatures from greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, and of course, the Arctic also warms. The Arctic also has greenhouse gases. There are circulation, uh, that circulations that bring that warmth to the Arctic. So the Arctic is warming as well. But then that warming leads to more melting of the ice and importantly the sea ice and you see the scene here in the picture uh, the ocean's dark the ice is light and so if you have more ocean what happens is you have less reflection of sunlight back to space and more absorption of that sunlight in the ocean which further warms the ocean and further melts the ice and so on and so on uh, in this feedback called the ice albedo feedback it's a pretty common feedback i think most of us uh, have probably heard about it at some level but a really important thing about the Arctic is that there are actually many feedbacks that are related to this ice albedo feedback uh, and also uh, acting on their own in, in some ways, related to things like changes in cloud cover, changes in water vapor available for the atmosphere, uh, radiation, temperature profile. So there's this whole complex network of these feedbacks that are interacting uh, and that sometimes amplifying uh, temperature changes, sometimes damping those down. Uh, and it's really this complex web uh, that we have to understand to really get a handle on why the Arctic is changing so much. So this change in the Arctic is manifesting in the decline of sea ice. And, and this diagram really shows this nicely. Uh, this is 200 years of uh, mostly predicted sea ice extent at the end of the summer melt season. This is in September. All these different colorful uh, squiggles are different model simulations, model projections of the sea ice extent over time. The red squiggle in the middle are the actual observations that we have from satellite data. 
And, and so you see, of course, that we're right in the middle of this rapid decline in sea ice. And the models suggest that in time, that sea ice in September will likely be going away altogether. So there will be ice-free summers in the Arctic. And that's pretty extraordinary for our global system. Um, but another point here is that there's actually a lot of a disagreement among these models, right? A big spread in their projections of the sea ice extent. And that tells us as well that perhaps we're missing a few details, right? These models are the best in the world, but they're still not great. They still don't necessarily agree very well. We have to uh, build in more understanding into these models so they can do a better job of forecasting the future for us. And then how does this Arctic change affect us, right? We all live at lower latitudes. How does this affect us? Why do we really care? And, and, you know, one aspect of that is, um, well, it's related to the jet stream, right? The jet stream is the, the high level winds that kind of flow around the earth and they bring a lot of the weather to us in the Northern hemisphere. They, they drive the variability in our weather. And the jet stream itself is this west to east flow of winds that's driven by the north to south temperature gradient. It's cold in the north, it's warm in the south, and it drives these winds to the east. Now, I just mentioned that with Arctic amplification, that there's more warming in the Arctic relative to lower latitudes. So what it's doing is it's actually decreasing this gradient, right? It's decreasing that temperature difference. And it stands to reason then that perhaps the jet stream might slow down. This, of course, is a, a bit of a hypothesis at this point, and we're really trying to understand the details. But if that were to happen, the jet stream might meander more further north and south as it goes on its path around the Earth. Uh, and this is really important for exacerbating some change. So uh, this meandering northward would pull more of that warm air from where we all live up towards the Arctic and really amplify further melting there. But also the meanders to the south will bring cold air from the Arctic down to more southerly locations. And we might get things like what happened in Texas a couple months ago, where we have these big freezing events that can affect us in many ways. And so global warming is not just a warming everywhere, right? There's variability and these are the details that we need to understand and we definitely need to understand the Arctic in order to get a handle on how the Arctic change is affecting the rest of the globe. And so all of this motivated us to go into the Arctic to really understand the changes in the sea ice, what's happening there in the central Arctic. And so our plans for this expedition, it was going to be international, bringing together many countries and interdisciplinary, looking at the atmosphere, the sea ice, the ocean from a physical chemical and biological perspective. It was multiple scale to look at in detailed processes, but also pan-Arctic processes and put those together, integrating both observations and modeling tools to enhance our understanding. And importantly, we wanted to extend over a full annual cycle to understand what happens in the summer, the winter, and everything in between. So how did it go? Let's take that journey. I'll show you some nice pictures and some nice science along the way. This, uh, to start, is a picture of the Polar Stern Icebreaker. Uh, this is from colleagues in Germany. It's a fantastic ship. This was our home for a year in the Arctic. And I'll show a couple maps like this. This is a map looking down on the North Pole. You see the cross here, that's the North Pole. And you see some land masses around that. So this is looking at the Arctic Ocean. There's a couple lines here. This is the ice edge uh, at the in the middle of September, which is the ice minimum, and the ice maximum in March is out here on the edge. And you, these little colorful squiggles I'll show going forward here are the different components of our expedition, the different legs. So we took off from Norway, we sailed up into the Arctic, broke through the sea ice, and found a place to park the ship and turn off the engines and passively drift with the ice for a year. So here's some nice pictures going through the sea ice uh, with this ship. Uh, eventually, we found an ice flow that we thought would be suitable. We explored that and we determined, yes, this is our home for the next year. And then we started setting up all kinds of equipment out on that ice, uh, installations to, to look at all different kinds of systems, uh, things going down below the ice into the ocean, things embedded within the ice, things looking up at the atmosphere, all kinds of different uh, instruments. Here's a great picture from well, my home out there was Met City. We had all kinds of equipment there and you can see the ship in the distance. And one of the important things right now in this picture is it's dark. Shortly after we got there, the sun set for good. For the next four months, it was dark. And this is a really important part about the polar regions, of course, is you get seasonal darkness and seasonal light. And that is super essential for the processes playing out there. And it's a challenge for doing science, of course. Um, 
After we set things up, we started this very comprehensive physical measurement and sampling program. So here's a gentleman looking at some properties of the snow. We're looking at the sea ice. We're collecting uh, biological critters from the ocean waters. We're looking at, at all aspects of the system. And very early in this process and often throughout, we had ice dynamics, right? The winds are blowing, the ocean currents are moving and it puts stress on the ice and the ice gives away and breaks. And this is a picture right off the side of our ship where, oh, oh here comes a crack right through camp. Uh, how do we respond to this? So that was one of the interesting aspects to keep us on our toes. So moving then into the next phase, leg two, this is the heart of winter. This is when there is no sunlight. Uh, the temperatures got down to minus 43 degrees Celsius, which is about the same in Fahrenheit. So this is a great picture um, of one of my stations, actually. My group, we build these sled-based stations to monitor all aspects of the energy transfer from the atmosphere to the uh, ice and ocean surface. Uh, it's measuring radiation, turbulence, and all other uh, terms in that surface energy budget. So this will come up a little bit later in my presentation. But also in the middle of the night, what does happen to that biology? To all that stuff that Hugh was talking about in the Antarctic, it, it's a big question. So in the Arctic, you know, it's dark there for four months. What happens to that biology in the middle of winter and how does that affect what happens later on in the spring and summer? And so we collected all kinds of samples uh, of little critters, the phytoplankton and uh, all kinds of other things, algaes and, and what have you to look at what actually is happening to that biology in the middle of winter. So that'll be exciting uh, to, to do those analyses going forward. Moving on to the third phase, the leg three for mosaic. You see here in the green that it's much longer than the other two. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is COVID. COVID really wreaked some havoc on our ability to rotate people and bring other ships in and out. So we actually had this period where people were trapped out there for a couple of months longer than they, they uh, anticipated. So that's interesting. But also another aspect of this uh, is what I show in this diagram right here. This again is looking down on the North Pole and you see some of the land masses labeled around the outside edge. This is what's called a composite analysis. So this is looking for the months of January, February, March of 2020. And it's saying, what, how are the winds different from climatology? The climatology is defined as from uh, 1981 to 2010. How are the winds different during this specific year when we were out there? And what we see is this color. So right near the North Pole, right where we were, you see this nice green kind of bullseye there. That means uh, winds were three to four meters per second stronger than they typically are. And you can see the little arrows there. And I've given you a nice big red arrow to kind of show they were blowing us along the way that we were already headed, but much faster than we planned. So it really elongated that, that one stretch of this leg of our operations out there. And those winds, while well, they also wreak havoc, right? High winds, rapid ice movements leads to a lot of dynamics. And so here's a great picture looking at our ship frozen in the ice. And you see these areas where the ice is broken all around our camp. Uh, we were embedded right in the middle of this. And of course, this was a huge challenge for our operations. Uh, out in the distance, there was my Met City where I did a lot of my work. Uh, you can see that the commute to work today was a little harder than most other days. Uh, we were constantly trying to respond to the Arctic as it manifested itself right in front of us. So really an extraordinary challenge there. So this is a nice diagram showing some of the kinds of data that we take there. And this is temperature measurements through the atmosphere ice ocean system uh, and how those evolve over the course of the year along with the ice. And so I've kind of noted here the atmosphere, uh, ice in the ocean, the, the, the depth is in centimeters. So it's just barely into the into the atmosphere above, barely into the ocean below, and mostly through the ice here. Um, one thing we can see here, so the ocean is at about minus two, that's about the, the freezing point of salty ocean water. Uh, and so this interface you can see um, between the ocean and the sea ice is going further down. This is the ice growing over the course of time. This is the axis at the bottom is time uh, with you know year day from 2020. So zero is January 1st, 2020. So, through the winter time, we see the growth of the ice. Um, there's all kinds of heat conduction, right? The warmest thing around in the winter time is the ocean water below. So heat is conducting up through the ocean constantly. And that heat conduction up is kind of dependent on what's happening on uh, the top side. 
And so the atmosphere brings all this variability. And you see a lot of variability in the colors here. You see these periodic um, warmer colors, the yellows and reds. These are storms that come through and bring warmth. And so they're sending that warmth down or they're putting a cap on that, on the ability of the ice to cool. And then there's times in between where the blues are, where there's no uh, storms, there's not as many clouds and the surface just radiates to space and loses all this energy and helps to grow the ice. So very interesting process there. And then as we start to move a little bit towards the spring and summer, we start to see the ice, these little pulses of warmth come in. It warms up the core of the ice towards the melting point. And, you know, as we all know from our, our science classes that ice won't melt until it all gets to the melting point. And so you see here at the far right of this diagram, finally the ice fully gets to that melting point here, uh, minus two to zero degrees Celsius. Uh, and then the melting season uh, starts. So this evolution is so important. If you want to understand why ice grows, why it melts, and how is it changing, we have to understand all these energetic terms and how they're interacting. Okay, let's move into the melt season then. This is leg four and the blue line. And you can see we're getting very close to the ice edge. This is an exciting time of the year. So I've got some great pictures. Of course, it's daylight. You know, it's, it's sunny out 24 hours a day for multiple months. So you get all kinds of fabulous views. And this is a nice picture from a helicopter looking at our ship moored to this ice flow in the middle of summer. You see these things that look like lakes. Those are melt ponds. This is the, the snow and ice melting and pooling together uh, in big uh, ponds of water on top of the ice surface. Of course, that's a challenge for operations. We have to build bridges and, uh, you know, try to move our things around and keep them dry. We did all kinds of great sampling, like taking ice cores to look at the physical and biological properties of that ice. Uh, we sampled things like the ice thickness, the snow depth, melt pond depth, moving all around to try to understand the spatial variability of those things. We looked at uh, things like radiation. How is that surface reflectance dependent on if you have a melt pond, an ice, the, an open ocean? These people are sampling down into the ocean, sending instruments down to look at the profile of temperature and salinity and other properties so we can understand the ocean structure. Uh, here's a great underwater picture looking down uh, at some current, uh, a current measurement device to give us information on the currents and the mixing. And so just a little view into the, that ocean structure in a kind of conceptual way. This data is not actually from our observations there. It's from a, a, a different time. But it just shows the concept of the kind of things we're trying to study there and the data that we hope to, to really pull together from our observations. And what I've shown here is this is a year of data of the temperature of the upper ocean. These are meters going down into the ocean. And this is the temperature above the freezing point. So, you know, the bluish colors are right about freezing and the, the other colors are a little warmer than that. And then above that, I show a, a band with the ice. The whiter colors are where there's lots of ice. The bluer colors are where there's less ice, thinner ice and also a band with the sun, right? The winter time is totally dark, there's no sun. The summer time has a lot of sun. And so let's walk through the year to look at some of the processes involved here. In the winter time, we have all that radiative cooling. The surface is cooling uh, up to space, it's losing energy, and that cooling helps the ice to grow. As the ice grows, it rejects a lot of its salt, a lot of its brine, and that salty cold water leads, it's really dense, it wants to sink, it drives the circulation that really deepens the ocean mix layer. And so you see over time over the winter, this deepening of the dark blue layer in this diagram of the ocean mix layer. Then as we move into spring and summer, the sun comes out, uh, the solar heating leads to ice melt, it heats the upper ocean, uh, and the mix layer becomes thinner because of all that heat uh, that is up in the upper ocean. And then we move around to the fall and sunlight is uh, kind of diminishing again. The surface starts to cool again, but all that heat that's been accumulated in the ocean mix layer has to be lost before the ice can form again. And so this fluxes of energy at this time of year are so important, losing that heat from the upper ocean so that we can then uh, repeat this pattern again. We can start that ice growth uh, and go through the year again. So. We got all the way to the ice edge and we had to actually reset our ship back near the North Pole to finish out the year. So we went to do that. A couple quick pictures there. We had to use helicopters to make our installations because uh, of so much extensive melt at this time of year. Um, here's a great picture of one of my flux stations, again, measuring uh, the surface, the melt pond and the energy transfer as that melt pond is starting to freeze. 
our year in the Arctic is conveyed here by, this is the sea ice extent over the course of the year. And the gray shading is the sea ice extent that we would expect from long-term statistics. Our year is in the blue here. And you see that we got down to a September a sea ice extent minimum that was the second lowest on record. So it's a really important year that we were out there measuring the sea ice. Only 2012 had a lower sea ice extent in September. So a little bit by the numbers, Mosaic was huge. We had 20 nations involved. Uh, we had seven icebreakers uh, or ships out there with more than 80 institutions involved and more than 400 people went out to the field as part of this with a total budget of over $170 million. What happened in our year there? Well, we had many challenges, of course. The ice was very thin and dynamic, but we were embedded right in the middle of this dynamic scene, which is the manifestation of Arctic change. So we were there to see the Arctic unfolding for us. We did tons of science, cutting across the ocean, the ice and the atmosphere. We had international participants, interdisciplinary scientists. And importantly, and this is important to, to this crowd here, is we built a whole new generation of trained scientists. And this is the kind of, uh, thing for you all, all you students going forward. This might be of interest to you and we need you. We need more people with new creative ideas to come out here and understand and study uh, the Arctic system. And what would a presentation like this be without a picture of a polar bear? So here's our mega fauna in the, in the Arctic. We had lots of polar bears visit. It was really fantastic to see. Uh, it just keeps me coming back to see creatures like this and many others. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. And happy to take any questions. Hi, uh, you too. It looks like you have a question. Yeah, first of all, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I had a question about the data collection. Um, there is a diagram with the temperature profile over time in 2020. Um, and I was wondering if that was like taken in just a single column or averaged over a small area or was it throughout the path of your ship? That's a great question. So our ship was following a piece of ice, right? We were moored to that piece of ice, passively drifting with it, looking at all the energy transfer and the changes. And so it was one piece of ice over the course of the year that we were following, but we took those kind of measurements all over the place, right? It, it, your question's a great one because you can't just measure one point, right? That doesn't tell you the whole story. You have to measure thick ice and thin ice and new, old, new ice and old ice. And so we tried to do as much as we could to understand how representative our observations were of the ice in general and this coupled system. So that's a great question. Uh, Diana, you had a question? Sure. When the um, ice starts to melt and you get those little freshwater, are they freshwater pools on the surface or saltwater? Uh, and are there any organisms that are little ecosystem that builds up in those freshwater pools? Or yeah, they are fresh. Um, you can taste them and we often did, right? Um, it, they are fresh initially. Eventually they actually start to diffuse a little bit and they melt out. And so uh, they'd melt all the way through to the ocean below and then you start to get some mixing and of course uh, the biology happening in there is totally dependent on those processes right most of the biology is is accustomed to a salty environment and so uh, you can imagine that it's going to depend a little bit on those processes uh, but we definitely had teams of people looking at of course the ocean water the melt pond water what's in the sea ice and how are all these things related in terms of uh, the biology that likes to play and live in those spaces. So uh, yeah, it's a great question and we're definitely trying to answer some of that uh, going forward here. Thank you, Matthew. Are there any last minute questions? Please use the, uh, the heart reaction. Anybody's got a question? Oh, we've got a heart. Uh, Jamie. Uh, I, I had a question about the second diagram that you showed about the atmosphere temperature and then all the heat fluxes in the ocean. Um, I noticed that, and you mentioned that during the storms, there's a lot of heat flux. Um, that there's less, there, there appeared to be less heat flux out of the ocean and it seemed like the atmosphere was warmer then. Uh, is, can, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so heat transfer, is, it's, it's really important balance, right? And 
the general thing that's happening in the wintertime especially is that the ocean is the warmest thing around and so heat conducts upwards and it reaches the top of the ice and part of that process right the conduction of heat is based on a temperature gradient so if you have this very cold above very warm below then heat's going to move from warm to cold and that happens so as the atmosphere brings warmth in above then the gradient of temperature is actually less and therefore there's less conduction of heat upwards. So it's all this really delicate balance between the amount of radiative energy coming from the atmosphere, the amount of conduction coming up from below. There's also turbulent mixing of heat. All these terms are in balance, right? There's no, no energy that's created or lost. It's just a matter of where it comes and where it goes. And so those are the kind of balances that are really important there and, and the, the kind of processes that we're, we're studying to, to better understand those balances. Excellent question. All right, last call for questions. Anybody has an additional question? Nope, we've got one. Uh, Jason. Hi, Dr. Shoup. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering more about the logistics of the expedition. So, for example, um, like, how did you deal with food and, like, did COVID impact that in any way? Could you talk about that a little more? Yeah, um, the logistics are challenged, of course, right? Um, the Arctic is cold, especially wintertime. Uh, we brought multiple ships in and out. Uh, for each leg, we rotated crew and we brought food and fuel. Uh, so there were fresh supplies every couple of months, typically. And, you know, the ship does a great job of cooking. So it was actually quite comfortable when you were on board the ship, maybe a little colder out on the ice. Um, so, yeah, the logistics... Um, it was a big endeavor and COVID did affect it, right? So in the heart of COVID, uh, we were supposed to be rotating people and we could not travel internationally. Uh, a couple of our ships decided that they just couldn't do this anymore because of the risks. And so we actually were faced with a huge challenge of how do we get our people back home? Uh, and how do we get our new people in there? Or do we have to end this expedition altogether, right? For a while, there was a risk of that. And so it was very stressful last year, uh, last spring, especially, uh, uh, as we were trying to sort that out. All right, thank you guys for the great questions. Any last? Okay. Amanda, well, thank you. Back. Go ahead, John. Yep. Sorry, Amanda, didn't mean to step on you there. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks again, Matthew. Uh, you know what? Uh, Certainly, uh, you know, a lot of insight there. I have one quick question for you. Uh, is there going to be a mosaic too over this coming winter or the year after? Uh, no, certainly not this coming winter or year after. This, I've been working on mosaic for 12 years to get it together. That's how long it took to convince the international community, to convince the funders. And so it's, yeah, it's not going to happen very soon. We'd like it, of course, to happen more frequently. For me, this kind of is the two. I, you know, 20 years ago, I was out there on a similar mission when I, Kind of started my career and so uh, you know mosaic is a representing the, the second version of that and hopefully there'll be more in the future and that's where i'd really reach out to a lot of the students here we need you right you can be the leaders and the participants of that next great expedition out to the central arctic we need uh, new scientists and so i really would encourage those of you that might be attracted here to pursue a, you know pursue a scientific research and hopefully go to the arctic it's really fantastic there yeah no, uh, well, yeah. Thanks for that. And I, I know, you know, it's hard enough being at sea and doing research for weeks, sometimes months at a time. At least some port calls, but just think of being trapped up there, dark for months at a time. <laughs> I mean, I know you probably get along well with all the other scientists up there, but there's like, <laughs> there's a lot of stress in many ways in doing that. So, uh, all of us, thank you. And yes, I couldn't have said it better. Certainly, uh, you know, that uh, you know. A lot of these folks listening to this and participating in the Ocean Sciences Bowl, you know, you may be next. These are great opportunities to do amazing type of scientific research. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you again for the great, uh, this is, you know, it was a great talk and presentation. For everybody here, you can also see why communicating science by both of these gents are just terrific. So thanks a lot, Matthew. Really, really appreciate that. Very good. Thank you very much for having me. All right, and with that, now we're going to go to what everyone has been waiting for. Uh, so, uh, you know, as we move from looking at the importance of the polar regions, uh, both from an ocean and atmospheric earth science to really, really get a handle on what's going on on our planet, 
Uh, you know, now we're going to, you know, basically focus on where we're going from here and what's important now, which is we're looking at our teams. Uh, so we have 21 teams who are participating in this modified virtual version of our event. Again, thank you for remaining flexible over the past year in the regional bowls. And thank you especially to all the volunteers, to the RCs, the coaches. I mean, you know, it's hard enough to do it physically. It's much harder, I think, in this environment. In some ways it's easier, but uh, yeah, it's a challenge. And hopefully we can get back to physical things next year. Uh, so the program uh, will be coming out. We'll try to get a link to that in chat. Hopefully the thing was sent out. So I encourage you all to look at that program. Uh, the program is amazing, especially the part to talk about the teams that we're going to walk through very briefly here in just a second. Uh, love the photos. The photos of the teams are great. You know, we've got NOSB logos. We've got origami, cats, dogs, dinosaurs. We have beds that are made and unmade, heirloom tomatoes, outer space residents, glaciers and pancake ice, head bows, and yes, a squid hat. So thank you for that. I also really, as always, love the descriptions. Uh, we have great nicknames. We have favorite organisms, including sea sheep, which is one of my favorite because it's a nudibranch, the most beautiful animal on this planet, I believe. Um, we have things about activities and hobbies, including crab larvae as a hobby and lobster doctoring, uh, whatever that is. Uh, we have people uh, who only study on prime number days, which I guess means uh, that's going to be for you guys at Tesla. I think that's you're going to study tonight, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> anyway. And we even have an ambition for one entire team to study um, underwater basket weave weaving at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. You'll be happy to know I pass that along to Dr. Margaret Lyman, uh, who's the head, the president of Scripps. And she looks forward to having all of you there as students and showing you how difficult it really is to weave baskets underwater, especially if you're using fronds from boa kelp. So look forward to that. So with no further ado, I will... Uh, now uh, introduce our team. So first of all, we will start with, uh, you know, again, a lot, a lot of first timers here, but a lot of repeat offenders as well. So the Blue Crab Bowl, it's uh, from the high school at Chesapeake Bay's Governor's School for Marine and Environmental Science. And so uh, you can see that. The next one is uh, from the Blue Heron Bowl. We have Inlow High School in Raleigh, North Carolina. The Blue Lobster Bowl, Lexington High School in Lexington, Massachusetts. And the Chesapeake Bay Bowl, Thomas and Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, also known around here as TJ. It's about five miles from my house, and that's in Alexandria, Virginia. The Dolphin Challenge, uh, that's, uh, that is Oxford High School in Oxford, Mississippi. We have the Garibaldi Bowl, uh, that's Canyon Crest Academy in San Diego, California. And then we have the Great Lakes Bowl, and that's uh, from Saline High School. Uh, and by the way, uh, they have, as far as I'm concerned, they have the best photos. They have a crab with a plastic water bell. How great is that? But if you read in the program, they also describe Zozanthele as an animal. So, uh, okay, well, anyway, no points off during the competition for that. Next is the Lake Sturgeon Bowl with Eisenhower High School from New Berlin, Wisconsin, at Ocean State. And the Los Angeles Surf Bowl, and again, a repeat offender, uh, and one of the, really in the last year's a real tough team, that's Santa Monica High School. Good to have you folks back, so nice. The Manatee Bowl, Gulliver Prep in Miami. And the Nor'easter Bowl, York High School in York, Maine. The Orca Bowl with Tesla STEM High School in Redmond, Washington. And yes, that's the one they're all going to scripts apparently to do underwater basket reading. The Penguin Bowl from Centerville High School in Ohio. The Quahog Bowl. Edwin O. Smith High School in Storrs, Connecticut. The Salmon Bowl, Benson Polytechnic High School in Portland, Oregon. And hey, as far as the write-ups go, you guys win because you had a sea shanty and it is fantastic. So I salute you folks in the Salmon Bowl, especially as an 80 guy loves sea shanties. So uh, you certainly set a very high bar, very well done. 
I, I would I would sing it, but then everyone would drop off. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, the Sea Lion Bowl. It's uh, and that is Doherty Valley High School in San Ramon, California. The Shore Bowl in West Windsor, Plainsboro North in Plainsboro, New Jersey. The Southern Stingray Bowl, a Rockdale Magnet School for Science and Technology in Conyers, Georgia. The Spoonbill Bowl from Gainesville 4-H on Gainesville, Florida, and Go Gators as a Florida native. The Trout Bowl with Thunder Basin High School from Douglas, Wyoming, where they say they have negative 0.5 oceans in their state. Uh, so they also describe themselves very much as an underdog, their first trip here. Uh, and they basically have an aversion to all things that you think of in Wyoming, bears, moose, wolves, and tourists up in the Grand Teton and uh, certainly in Yellowstone. But again, it's great to have you joining in the ocean. Hopefully, uh, without some major changes and the polls that we've talked about in the near term, you won't be seeing oceans in Wyoming, at least for a while. And finally, the Tsunami Bowl with Juno Douglas High School in Juno, where they also have a lot of darkness in the winter. So again, uh, these teams won their regional competitions that were held in February, March. They have a lot to celebrate already, but we're thrilled to have you here. And so a round of applause for all of you. Um, I also just want to make a quick statement that I could tell by several of the write-ups and that by talking to many of the competitors for many years, I really appreciate the focus of um, our students, our coaches, our instructors in this bowl on uh, all the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, um, you know, right now it's a challenging time in many of these areas, but I think leading the efforts in science and you know, getting the National Ocean Sciences Bowl out to provide opportunities more for more communities, underserved uh, folks and, and populations, you know, it's really great. So I just wanna thank you for your commitment to that as well. It's great to see that reflected, not just in your comments, but in knowing so many of you. So certainly this bowl is a chance to advance that. And we've done it greatly in the past as well. So just thank you for that. Uh, so nearly a thousand students across the country got to participate in this program that we all love, gain a greater understanding of the ocean, uh, its importance to our daily life, to the air system, and to our future, to include the many career options that you're going to have as future ocean leaders. Whatever field you go into, you're going to take a piece of the ocean, ocean with you, and everything that is done is related to the ocean on this planet, I'm convinced. So with that, it is normally at this point in the evening uh, that I say, hey, you need to get a good night's sleep, so go back to your hotel rooms and you know, turn off the lights or low lights, get a good night's sleep, and don't study too late, even if it is a prime number day. But since you're all at home, I know you're going to be less tempted to stay up late and study. Maybe you're having some late night Zoom sessions, uh, getting ready for the SEBs, who knows, but uh, maybe gaming. Uh, but either way, I just want to wish all of you the best of luck. Uh, an opportunity over this next week. I uh, thank you for the time, the energy, and dedication. Uh, there are certainly, uh, you know, going to be a lot of opportunities in, in the, this coming week for both those who move on throughout the, you know, throughout the sessions next weekend, uh, but it's going to be a great opportunity for all of you. Uh, I want to specifically, again, thank the regional coordinators, thank the alumni, the volunteers, the people who help write these questions every year, doing it virtually, especially challenging, all the folks who, assist, or who are going to assist with the SEBs tomorrow, and certainly the heroic staff of uh, the folks at COL, especially Melissa and Amanda, but the whole team as well. So thank you all for your great work this year and all years in putting this all together, making it possible. Uh, we could not do it without all of you, certainly. Uh, one advantage to going virtual, volunteers from all across the country can participate in view the finals and see our amazing team. So it's great to have people be, being able to do that. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry we can't be in person. It's one of the things that I've enjoyed most about being here uh, at this organization uh, for the last five and a half years. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, uh, and actually one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life. I really, really wish I could have been part of an Ocean Sciences Bowl back when I graduated from high school in 1977. They didn't have it. We had more boring things such as the Junior Classic 
the league for you Latin students and the math club team. Uh, but boy, I would have thrilled and thrilled with an ocean bowl. So anyway, I'll just say, uh, hopefully next year can come back to see meeting people in person, making friends, connections, lifelong sort of relationships with mentors and all those types of things. But I encourage you again, take advantage of the opportunities you have in the mentor sessions, get people's contact info. You never know what it might be handy to have say, hey, I remember having a conversation who was that individual and how do I get in touch with them? Please, please, I encourage you to really take advantage of that going forward. Uh, so, as I say a lot of times, there are gonna be winners and losers this year, but the real winner is the ocean and all life on the, this planet that relies on it, which is all of it. Uh, just like those who have gone before you over the past 23 years, I know that you're gonna help make the future of our ocean planet a little bit brighter in the days ahead. And we all know how much that's needed. Uh, so roll up your sleeves for the next week, but really roll up your ocean sleeves for the years that are in front of us all. Again, I wish you luck as you compete in the SEBs uh, over this weekend, the events next week, and certainly the buzz arounds over next weekend. I look forward to seeing all of you there. And with that, I just say a very good night, Ocean Bowlers. It's been fun. <laughs>